Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show. This is episode number 278 with me, your host, Agostino. How are you doing? How are you feeling? Great. Amazing. Before we get started, as per usual, if you're watching this via the YouTube and you like what you hear, give me a good thumbs up, give me a good little subscribe and leave me a little comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast app, why not leave me a five, five star review and share it with your friends so that everyone else can discover my humor. Anyway, apart from all that nonsense, how are you guys doing? It's been a while, isn't it? It's been a while. It's been like a week. I've been off grid. I've been really busy, like legitimately busy because I have goals and aspirations and stuff I want to do in my life, which is funny, isn't it? The more time you have, the less, the, the more time you have, the more busy you tend to be, right? You tend to think you are in your head. You like give yourself this weird little story that like, oh, I'm so busy. I have so much on my plate. But in reality, you don't. You're just recovering from alcoholic and drug induced comas for the last couple of weeks, right? But now I'm recovered. I'm now on the other side of the hill. I can see clearly now the the you know the rain has gone right that is where i am at the moment um but yeah i'm feeling good man feeling really good really strong i have to be honest i know no one's asked i'm just gonna tell you anyway because my podcast do what i want so i've been running a lot i've been training a lot um i've been doing many 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 interesting things outside of running and training which i won't really mention here because i don't want to mention them but no um for the most part i've been running and training I've been sticking with my unbreakable runner theme, so which essentially is you know running uh, using the kind of uh, CrossFit endurance methodology. So that means not many, mi- not much mileage, and just focusing on your form, focusing on your cadence, focusing on your tempo and your strength and your ability to basically maintain a form or a way of running until the very end of the finishing line. So that's been pretty fun. That's been a good time. Let me just move this camera a bit. The, the camera angle is always a bit messed up here because of that bookshelf is not really centered. But hey. What can you do? Send it myself. So um, that's been a bit fun. I've also been doing a lot of fasting. I've been on this um, one meal every day fast, which is the OMAD. Um, I've been using my app called Zero, which is from Kevin Rose fame, who is the founder of Dig. So this is sort of like my thing. And I've been trying to do it like um, once, uh, five days a week. So Monday to Friday or Sunday to Friday. I try and do at least um, some kind of intermittent fasting just to kind of make sure my body isn't feeling, you know, too messed up from all the weekend activities I get up to. So that's been pretty fun. Um, What else has been happening? I was meant to go to Berlin this weekend, but that didn't happen because, you know, I just ran out of money, basically. And part of me was also a bit worried about going to Berlin in January. I'm sure some of my friends or some people listening to this podcast will know um, Berlin in January is cheap to go to. The flights are, you know, peanuts, but... The reason why they pee is because no one wants to go there during that time. It's ridiculously cold. Um, really, 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 really cold. You forget the architecture in Berlin, how sparse it is as a, country, as a, sorry, as a city. It's very sparse. Wind hits you really firm in the face. All the best and more interesting clubs are in the middle of nowhere. So you're having to really brave the elements or to go out and rave. So it really requires a special kind of person who decides to go and, you know, um, battle through the windstorms to go to uh, Berlin to go have a good time. So I kind of put it off and now I'm going to go the end of February, which is one month after January. So not the most apropos time. And then I'm going back again for the May Day celebration. So it should be a, a real Berlin extravaganza this year. But that was what I was meant to do this weekend. So that's not happening. So instead, I'm going to go see Mind Against at E1 um, this weekend. That's happening. I think E1, right? E1, yeah. And then... Um, on Saturday, uh, before that, actually, I'm playing a gig at the uh, Leighton Star. So if you're around or if you live anywhere near Leighton, which I'm probably sure a lot of people on that listen to this podcast probably don't, but if you happen to live near Leighton and you want to hear me DJ, you want to hear me, well, the stuff that I play, because obviously I'm a big fan of dance music, as you guys are aware of, club culture, electronic music, all that good stuff, and you're wondering, what does this bloody weirdo guy that wears a woolly hat and sunglasses inside play? Definitely come along to my uh, next party. I title it called Labertees. Me playing all night. That's four hours set. Me slaying it, playing all the good stuff in one of my favorite bars in the area that I live in called uh, The Leighton Star. They have another one called The Heathcote Star. They have one called The Star Bethnal. You know, there's all those different little star star names of uh, places out and about there. But this is the this is the place that I'm playing. I'm quickly get out here on screen because my screen screen switch is not working for some reason. So let's just get it up on here. That move that Chris hope you guys can see this right yep there you go so this is my next party coming up here it's called Labertees with myself handsome black man taking place at the Leighton Star 1st of February this Saturday from 9 to 1 a.m 
little flyer I designed there, descriptions you can read there. Labatee's return to a latent star for an eclectic light of uh, or eclectic mixture of disco, hip hop, rock, and all things in between. Local DJ Hanson Black Man will guide you through the night with tons of drinks and offer. It's sure to be a memorable way to mark the start of the month or the end of the month really but hey i didn't change the description there because you know my eye isn't on the prize but <laughs> that that aside definitely come and check me out if you're that way inclined i'll be djing i'll be there having a good time hope you guys can join me on this very very momentous occasion there we go the star of later and all the latent star sorry so that should just be around the corner of my house do a little session there and then go straight after from there and head over for head over to the mind against party which is happening I'm going to say it's E1. I'm pretty sure it's E1, isn't it? Quick, 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 check it here. Mind Against. They had, they had a pretty cool set that just debuted now in Circle. I recommend you go check that out. Like, honestly, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing what they play, what they like live. That should be really fun. Oh, they're playing on in, well, in Paris today and then to London to tomorrow night. So that should be awesome. So, yeah, so it's... um. This is the party here. I'll get up on my screen for you guys to check out. So it's Mind Against with Kaimos and Rude Hagelstein and Ellie Verve playing at E1, which is 110 Pennington Street in Wapping. So definitely check that out. That's the Venn line up there. All that good stuff should be happening. So yeah, loads of stuff happening this weekend. Me DJing, Mind Against. Check it out. Get locked in. Make sure you're around if you're around. And if you happen to see me and you know, you know the vibes definitely come by and say hi i do not bite i do not bite anyway let's move on what do we want to talk about so much news to go through so many things i want to touch upon with you my friends so let's get started let's go in let's go in let's go in number one thing to get started on is the unfortunate passing of kobe bryant so a definitely r.i.p to him and thoughts and prayers go out to his family and everyone else included he's unfortunately his daughter passed away with him too who was all over the interwebs recently through that little meme that people were posting about Kobe and his daughter sitting courtside, I think watching the Lakers or watching a random basketball game and him kind of running the game through her and just kind of going back and forth about tactics and shit, I'm assuming, about basketball. So that was a very touching moment, you know. Um, there's always a very special connection between a father and a daughter, especially a father that's, you know, an elite athlete like Kobe Bryant is. There's always a real uh, kindred relationship they have, you know, the whole like uh, dad, daddy-daughter uh, relationship thing, and I think out of all this misery has come a really cool hashtag. I think it's called girl dad, dad girl, girl dad or girl, I think it's called girl dad hashtag girl dad. It's a really touching little hashtag has turned up on social media. All these dads all over the world are kind of uh, sharing po photos of them with their daughters and interesting stories about the challenges and the beauty of raising you know a whole gaggle of young women in this world that we live in. So um, very unfortunate passing and thoughts and prayers go out to him. But part of the you know the mess that's kind of happened from this catastrophe that's over you know destroyed so many families. I'm sure that one occasion you know death is like that and it's so be bewildering like that where it kind of has the effect of just destroying so many families all at once especially something so tragic like this so as you guys are aware Ari Shafir has landed himself a bit of hot water right Ari Shafir the no hose barred comedian I'm sure some of you guys are aware of who listens to my podcast so he does this thing mostly every time a celebrity dies where he runs to Twitter and tries to make the most harshest the most cutting and hopefully the most funniest joke observation of the day right and the whole point of it I don't really know I think the point of it is to kind of relieve grief I'm assuming because I hear a lot of comedians say whenever someone in a comedy world dies, which is different from obviously a civilian or different from a sportsman or an athlete or a public figure because, you know, they're not involved in that world. But whenever a comedian dies and they go to their wake, there's always a, there's always an, there's always occasion that happens when the f actual friends of the comedian who grew up with him or her go up on stage and, you know, weep their eyes out and talk about, you know, times that they remember them growing up and moments and stuff. But there's also an occasion when comedians actually go up on stage and the first thing they want to do is make everyone laugh to kind of release attention. So that's where maybe it's coming from. And, and, I, and I imagine too, one part of the process of grieving, you know, you go through the denial stage, the depression stage, the, all that thing. There might be a stage in grieving where, because again, I've been fortunate where none, no one really close to me has passed away. The last little celebrity that really kind of caught me off guard was probably XXXTentacion, you know, as corny as that may sound, because I, followed, I was following his career from SoundCloud all the way. Um, who else really, really hurt me? I can't really think. Yeah, not really many, to be honest. And I've been lucky with my family, too. But I would imagine humor might play a part in the grieving process. So I can I can see the allure of it. But for me, personally, I never got the whole running on Twitter to make a real dark joke. I didn't really quite see that way that was funny. But again, I'm not going to be one of the people to say, oh, I don't want them to say that thing. I think everyone should be allowed to say what they want to say. 
but they should they should also be um willing and accepting of the consequences of, of, of what they say that's part of the reason why i think counterculture exists because i think for the most part there was there was no repercussions for anyone especially people that were in power it feels like it right now it's been muddled and it turned into some other thing but i think there was there was there there never was a repercussion because as soon as you attain a certain level a stature a certain monetary value in your account it seems as if the law didn't didn't apply to you right same same way same way we could say like prince andrew was photographed hanging around with you know um what's his name uh whatever his name uh jeffrey epstein right and he's just wandering around you know not caring the world he's not being subpoenaed he's not being pulled in for questioning and that's it they just to be able to get away now imagine if you were hanging around and there was pictures of you you know being in a house of a known sex offender right just me and you right just hanging out having a good time do you think that please just let us just carry on our day to day daily lives probably not so maybe me too came out of that kind of frustration that these men were sexually taking advantage of the power dynamic inside of the entertainment industry which is already messed up as it is because you know there's the gatekeeper thing so people are coming into it already with their guard down already willing and able to kind of do anything and everything to achieve their dreams and those guys are taking advantage of it right instead of kind of doing the honorable thing and saying hey man what the fuck are you doing like put your top back on this is a serious meeting i don't i don't need to do that nonsense right or just being the kind of what what they call them being the ally right they women need some guys took advantage so maybe there is that part of it, right? kind of culture. So anyway he makes this really mad joke on twitter it doesn't really go too far but then the thing that really kind of really got Ari in hot bubble was this video he put out on Instagram that he immediately, I think, deleted soon after, which I don't really have that much respect for. I think if you're going to be edgy, if you're going to be the dark lord of humour, you should just commit to it all the way through. That's the only thing that, again, I don't find it funny. It's not my kind of humour, but if you're going to be that guy, just live with it. But I guess, you know, someone within his immediate circle, someone that whose opinion he kind of trusts and respects, told him, like, hey, Ari, you need to kind of take that thing off. And he ended up doing it. So let me just quickly get up on you. So you guys can see. It's not this one. That's the odd one. Where is it? There we go here. So this is the video, right? Someone posted it on the old um, interweb. So let's quickly get up on here. Boom. Let's see what you guys. As I know, there's always a lot of like hate, pain in the world, and it's always a bunch of terrible stories. And every once in a while, there's a good story. <laughs> good story comes out. You know, it's funny. If you listen to his podcast, you know just what he's doing here. He does this all the time. It's his kind of, what they call it, a misdirection that he does a lot. He's really good at it, right? The dark misdirection. And again, it's a real shame this has happened because I'm a big fan of Irish Affairs. I love his um, Skeptic Tank podcast. I love his appearances on other podcasts. I think the fact that he's so, like, like spectrum-y, right? There's a little bit of touch of Asperger's about him makes him funnier. The fact that he genuinely gives zero fucks as well makes him more funnier. And again, a lot of people say they don't give a fuck. Like, you know, one that comes to mind is Joe Biden. He, for someone that doesn't give a fuck, he does go on a lot about his feelings, right? So I don't really think he gives, he, I don't think he, he, he gives more of a damn than he lets on. But I get the feeling Irish Shafir will genuinely, you know, be happy to do stand-up comedy in front of a crowd of five for the rest of his life if he got paid. He doesn't really care. So um, this is a shame it's happening. But again, he did it to himself. So again, you have to, fake, you have to live, live with the consequences. This is what it is, isn't it? The guy who got away with rape <laughs> got his today. That's aggressive. Kobe Bryant is a god. I'm here in Charlotte, the home of the team that originally drafted him. Uh, maybe he wouldn't have raped that chicken Denver if he had been if he had stayed in Charlotte with the Hornets. But anyway, and again, that's aggressive, right? So again, I don't know nothing about basketball. I'm assuming Kobe Bryant used to play for this this team, right, back in the day, and now he happens to be there, and he's just going off on Kobe about these supposed rape allegations. And again, it's a really bad taste, right? Again, let's just say as a human being, it's in bad taste. It's, it's a bit crass. It's a makes you feel a bit yucky. And um, yeah, I don't find it funny. But again, he should have the right to say what he wants, but he should also be able to face up to the consequences. Now, he says this, right? And of course, social media goes crazy. And the thing that was immediately cutting to me, the thing that really kind of hurt me watching this was that oh, I immediately thought about his friends. I immediately thought about his agent. I immediately thought about his manager. I immediately thought about his family, his girlfriend, all these people who were going to be negatively affected by his just... Um, impulsive kind of carefree I don't give a fuck attitude because I think it's fine when you're alone when you're literally like there's no one else in your family alive or no immediate family that can suffer the consequences of your actions I think it's fine fly off the seat of your pants you know what I mean do your thing but when you have people depending on you an agent a manager a booking or whatever they're a team who kind of 
support a family on your talent on you know what I mean through the, the the works the kind of the gifts that you've been bestowed upon you they are also kind of leveraging their harness on you too helping you out so that you can help them out with some money to make their family life a bit easier or to kind of allow them to follow their dreams and then you're jeopardizing it all just for a joke it's like oh especially a joke like this like if you're gonna die on the hill you you don't is this the hill you want to die on the lebron j the sorry the, the kobe bryant has passed away hill is this the one you want to go for especially in la now i don't know nothing about basketball again don't don't tell me to don't don't ask me to d- describe the rules to you or n- name a club outside of chicago la lakers and brooklyn nets don't know any right but from the outside in kobe bryant seemed like a bigger than life character he didn't even seem like an athlete he seemed like a cultural icon right not even to people in LA or people on the West Coast, to the entire United States, right? If you follow sports, you know who Kobe is. And even outside of sports, especially now with all the work he's doing, philanthropy, the charities he's setting up, the academy. Like, I've known more about Kobe these last few years than I knew about him in basketball because he's doing stuff that kind of seeps into my world, right? Self-improvement, actualization, goal setting, um, all these things I'm kind of interested in. He's kind of infiltrated it because, of course, he kind of lives and breathes it, right? He is a black member after all. So I got the feeling straight away that maybe this wasn't a good idea to do, especially because he's been hanging around in LA quite often, Ari, it feels like. Again, he hasn't moved there, I don't think. I remember him talking about being in New York still and trying to get a studio for his podcast, but it seems like he's been spending a lot of time in LA. And of course, he's part of the Joe Rogan inner sanctum, so there is part of that's like, for how finicky and how um, up their own ass Hollywood elites are, especially that kind of liberal group, you have to be really aware of what you're doing when you're kind of like going at them. You have to be aware that, okay, cool. If I do this thing, it's going to fuck up every kind of deal I have in place for the next 18 months. That's what happens for the most part. And then unfortunately, because the entertainment industry is so fickle, by the time you come back after 18 months, they've moved on to somebody else and you become ice cold, right? So I kind of thought it's not the smartest thing to do if you're an LA adjacent comment, comic. If Of course, if you, li- if you live in New York, you can kind of come in, flame throw the place and go back to New York and no one will care. For the most part, I would imagine, especially if you're doing the smaller rooms. But if you're trying to be an LA comic or you're trying to infiltrate that scene and you're trying to get deals off the back of that scene, because I'm sure he had a special in mind that supposedly has been canned or put on ice. All these dates that he had coming up have been cancelled. He's got a, supposedly, I read on the internet, he has a police um, security detail outside of his house. His uh, father's address got doxxed, who happens to be a Holocaust survivor who's like 90 years old or something. So again, look at the damage that one action, this one video has caused to people who aren't even involved in your silly little games, right? So that's the thing I have with it. But the problem I have with it the most, right, is the fact that other comedians are going at him. That's the disgusting thing. I think there has to be a brotherhood. There has to be a support system in place where, again, if you don't if you don't agree with what he said as a joke, cool, just don't say nothing. But the fact that comedians are eating their own and trying to align themselves with kind of like the mainstream media elites or the journalists and trying to be like all woke and stuff is nasty and quite disgusting because sooner rather than later, they're going to come for you, right? They, they, it's like they, it, it eats his own tail, that whole council culture stuff. It doesn't, it, there is no line. There is no, no one's out of bounds. No one is kind of like above reproach. Like you will get thrown under the bus too. So, and the only people that will, that will help you out or that will hold, hold you up it's going to be the comedians, right? It would be similar to like Jeremy Piven. Imagine Jeremy Piven came out and started trashing Ari Shafir, right? That would be the height of hypocrisy because the reason why he's got a career now is because comedians don't really give a fuck what you do outside of comedy, right? If anything, they, they think it's going to add to your actual appeal on stage. You're going to be a more interesting person because you have this real life situation that you've kind of gone through or you went through. But if for, for, for Jeremy Piven to kind of suddenly say, oh, I'm going to kick Ari Shafir while she's down, and lie myself with these guys is nonsense because sooner or later they're gonna unearth another allegation another email is gonna come out another tweet and you're gonna be right back where you started from so you have to really it's not even a term of like know where your brother's bread is buttered but you have to really be kind of cognitive or aware of who your actual friends are in the industry again it's hard to do because the industry is kind of flaky by nature but you have to know where people are actually supporting you and people are not supporting you but then i, I don't know i guess if you're michael rapaport part of your shtick is kind of looking into a camera like that with your fucking you know face full of zits and stuff and shouting and if you're god if you're godfrey i would imagine you're not really part of that comedy scene really you're kind of there but not really you know what i mean you just happen to live in new york so that might be a thing so i don't know i don't know and i always think i feel that the black comics in new york are a little bit separate from the other comedy scenes a very weird scene in america isn't it there's a black comic scene and a white comic scene 
they don't really seem to overlap or the the black com- the black comics that white people think are funny in, in america don't necessarily overlap into the white black side maybe apart from dave Chappelle, i can't really think of many um that have kind of done it the other way around but again unfortunate situation i think it's friday now it probably will die down by the weekend um again the most people i'm mostly sorry about or like kind of like bummed out about are the people around ari his team who are going to be out of a paycheck who are going to be missing some money at the end of the month which is annoying um and of course for him he's on personal safety but again he's going to just he's got he's he's, he's a big boy he's got to pull up his trousers and he knows what the deal is isn't it you say that kind of stuff and i guess if he happens to go to i don't know man if this is even real though Will he actually go out and someone will actually punch him in the face because they don't like what he said about a sports person they look up to? Maybe, maybe not. But you can't really take that risk, right? A comedy club doesn't have the best security in the world. They're just people just walk in with anything on them. So there is a possibility of something really fucked up happening. So that is a possibility. So I guess him keeping his head down, locking his Twitter, um, turning off the comments on his Instagram is probably a good way to kind of quell all the outrage and then kind of pop up later on. But he put out a half-baked apology, which is probably not an apology on his way. I'm sure Ari doesn't care. He's not sorry. But I'm sure his friends and family are like, hey, Ari, we need you to kind of like fess up and, you know, at least kind of do us a solid on this one. So he's probably done it just for the sake of keeping the peace. But yeah, unfortunate situation for we're all involved. Hopefully it gets sorted out. Hopefully um, we see a return of Ari Shafir. But again, the you know the the counterculture thing is annoying, man. It really is annoying. Like again, if he does, if he's something you don't like and you don't want to be a part of, just I don't know, cuss him out on the comments, say something mean. I don't know why are you trying to seek out his agents and because that's what people do when someone says something um, untowards or something that they don't like, they'll go and start t- at in their agency, at in the comedy clubs they're going to perform at, calling up the comedy clubs, uh, fake bomb threats, all this stuff. So that you can get quote unquote cancelled in the me- in the kind of interim. It's just not a fun thing to do, man. But anyway, what can you do? I'm sure he'll bounce back. But interesting to hear what Joe Rogan will say about it. So far, my best um the best kind of take on it has been probably um Chris the uh, Crystalia. He said, Look, this is how he is, but I just don't get that kind of humour and I don't get it either. Um the worst takes have been probably Brendan Shaw and Brian Callan saying that it really hurt their feelings and shit. That was, you know, a little bit pathetic, but you know, we all kind of fall on different lines. It's either you fall on the Brendan Shaw, Brian Callan thing, how your feelings, or you're like Fear of Vaughan and Crystal Lee. You don't really care, but you're like, I would never do that. And that's where I kind of fall. But spare a thought for Brad Williams, right? How happy he must be now. Brad, Brad, comedian Brad Williams must be over the moon that Aisha Fear did this. And also, um, Penny for Leanne Kreischer's thoughts. I wonder what she thinks about this whole situation because she hates Aisha Fear's guts. So she must be absolutely reveling in the fact that he's... Um, by his own admission, kind of ruined his own career in the interim again. In the interim, because I'm sure in the end he'll be fine. But anyway, let's move on, man. Let's move on. What else is next on this list here that we have? Oh, Grease Mueller is probably gone now, I think. I spoke about it before previously. I'm pretty sure I've kind of exhausted this topic already, but I kind of wanted to go over it one last time. So, as you are aware, Grease Mueller has unfortunately been told to um, vacate their premises due to some uh, confusion or mess up when it comes to the planning permission. They were originally given permission to stay there for a prolonged period of time until the deal with the contractors was sorted out. Then it changed their mind. And now we're in a situation where they're still trying to appeal, still trying to petition it because, you know, you never know. You fight until the last minute and it might kind of kind of come through for you. But so far, the deal is that they're going to have to vacate the premises at the end of the week. So last um, last kind of last minute dot com, they set up a cocktail day more party which is kind of one of the premier parties at Grease Mule. I think they've done it for five years there, maybe seven. I'm not too sure. One of those kind of includes. I've been there once only, but I've been to Grease Mule a few times. But um, again, great promoters, great DJs all in all, great venue, and just a real mainstay of Berlin. And for me, like I mentioned in a previous podcast, it was definitely my go-to place. Uh, it was definitely my first Berlin experience. Uh, rocking up there, I remember precisely going there with a few friends and one of my friends hadn't concealed their vitamins in the appropriate position or appropriate place and by the time we walked up to the bouncer um and all berlin clubs are like this you have to kind of walk down the gangway somewhere knock on the door someone opens it looks and then closes it opens it again it's like a real it's like a real kind of a theater to the actual going out right the fact that you can't be too drunk going up on the way there not too high you have to be orderly it kind of adds to it and once you get inside the venue you can just let loose and kind of express yourself it's just the most picturesque place to be for a dance music fan. Anyway, we rock up to the front of the door. The bouncer opens the door, lets us in, such as the thing. And my friend that hasn't hit his vitamins properly, uh, <laughs> the guy basically looks at him with contempt. The bouncer, like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Like, you didn't, like, how, like, he looks at it. He was giving a look of disrespect. Like, he didn't even try it and attempt to hide it. And he kind of just casually opens it up, 
and just pours it all over the floor, rubs his feet all over it and tells him, you can go in now. Like, epic, epic. I remember that was my first experience of nightclub being like, okay, welcome to Berlin, right? Okay, cool, man. This, this is what it's like being in a Berlin spot. Um, so, yeah, great venue, great place to be in, great DJs, and just in general, just a great community they kind of built around it. And, again, I love the whole idea that that is where, if you really want to see club kids, if you really want to see people going for it on a night out, outside of Bergheim, that's definitely the place to be. And, again, I think it's probably the best party venue in Berlin, maybe outside of Stameheads. You know, I'm not talking about techno clubs. I'm talking about just like a party venue, just to go and have a good time, listen to some a wide variety of music. Um, definitely, I would advise checking out Grease Müller. Um, anyway, um, Resident Advisor put together a really cool article, a last event review, which I'm always a big fan of. I think their writing is stellar. They might have gone down this whole like woke political correctness way recently, but when it comes to writing reviews of events and shows and kind of features at the um what you call it art of djing stuff and the kind of spotlights on areas there are no there's no one really better than ra and this kind of and this review kind of really touches home for me and really speaks about the beauty of this place called grease Mueller. so this is it it's called grease Mueller. is this the end it's on resident advisor i'll link in the show notes for you guys to check out yourselves the article says the following uh this blowout berlin this is a the, the blowout this berlin club um deserves says the following here um, at around midday on Sunday, as I strolled along path from Sonnenhau to Griesmüller for possibly the last time, the only other people in sight were the middle-aged couple who seemed unlikely patrons of the 40-hour session. But to be fair, whenever you go to Berlin or nights out, especially good club nights, even in London, let me not talk too much about Berlin, in London too is the same. Um, a good sign of a really good party is packed toilets and a very diverse group, a very diverse crowd. Like, I mean, like, not in, like, colour and everyone's different. I mean, like, diverse and, like, okay, this guy works in finance, she's in this, she's, like, different ages, different ethnicities, different backgrounds, just a whole melting pot. That's where you see a really, really good raven, a really good promoter, a really good scene, a really good community. When it's just the same people, when you're all photographers, you're all stylists, you all have those um, big, chunky shoes on, you've all got weird piercings and stuff, that's when it's a bit naff. Um, I prefer it when it's a real hodgepodge of people. I'd imagine the same way with gay clubs, right? Uh, I'd imagine a good gay bar would be just all the dudes, not like a particular kind of dude, all the dudes. That was, that's what makes it more interesting. Like, oh my God, you, then you meet the love of your life and it happens to be some random dude who you'd have never met. But because you have this common interest, dance music, DJing, getting fucked up, that kind of brings you together. Um, that's that's probably more beautiful than it just being a club full of... That's why I hate going to fashion week parties, all right? Because it's just full of people that are into fashion. It's not, there's nothing interesting about that community at all, right? Buyers and um, agents and photographers and interns and people that have online magazines or instagram pages that's it right it's just a bit meh, it's a bit naff but when you get those people and you mix them with art people you mix them with people that work in architecture people that work in graphic design uh people that work in the skate world all right that's what makes those parties more interesting but again it's hard to find because i don't know the older people get the more they just start to the kind of like segue into their own little silos into their own little kind of um uh what, what do they call them echo chambers of kind of scenery i'll assume so but you know it's, it is what it is and you're older you don't need to fuck around I mean, let's continue with the article with the article um sure enough well, when they reach the door the 48 um the older couple bounce and muttered some few of them in german and they turn around the club's farewell party was like my own day barely two hours old i wandered through the dystopian outdoor area which is all this here as well it's probably got the best greece Miller might have the best sort of like outdoor soundscape or outdoor kind of activity area in most berlin clubs it's so cool. Um, what am I thinking of? Maybe the other one is probably quite cool. Maybe Club Division there because it's on literally on the on the canal as well with the kind of decking outside. That might be quite cool. Bar 25 I didn't end up going to. Maybe um, Cata Blue as well is quite nice on the outside. But I quite like Grease Miller with the whole like jungle gym thing and the planks outside. I think it's really, really cool. Anyway, it continues on here. Instead, the place was rocking. In Grease Miller, in true Grease Miller style, the previous night's CTM event had bled into Sunday morning, meaning Winter Garden, the scrappy wooden shed, which is this bit here, um, tacked onto the main building, was alive and well, oh, Ravers pumping house. And again, um, that's one of the best things I love about these Berlin places. They have this little makeshift wooden shack on the outside and in purposely put all these windows that are mirrored and some are covered, some are not, some are fragmented so that when the sunrise and this, the kind of light is spinning through or seeping through the windows, you get this amazing refraction and these lights and these kind of tones going off. And I remember just sitting on the edge or standing on the edge of the window as it's kind of beaming past your ears and it's kind of warming up the back of your ears and you get this 
tingling feeling from all the magnesium you've been having. It's just amazing, man. I flipping love it. Um, it continues on here. And never pick into silo the club's uh, subterranean while Oid Rave is pumping house. A nervy peek into silo. Yeah, da, da. This was the club's goodbye note to their friends and family, naming a dozen DJs and promoters who, until news broke of its inevitable close, called it home. Each crew was given a two-hour slot, which is perfect. I think it's quite hard to do those kind of like. I remember I did it when I went to play the birth, you know, the alibi closing party. You did like an hour of a two. It depends. It's quite hard to do it well um, because everyone's kind of playing a meld of music. But it continued on here. Um, at some point, at come eighth. No, so so um, they all got two hours which meant regular switches in genre, a detail that could have derailed the vibe, but actually kept things fun and fresh. Across 10 or so hours in Winter Garden, people flexed uh, to Loopy House by Mel, UK Garage Hits by Operate, a sleazy EMB, and Italo by Idiotech. Uh, techno and trance and ear and gabber dominated once the sun went down. At some point in the main room, one of the techno kids lads uh, honestly played one of the most anxiety inducing tunes I've ever heard two of my friends scattered in fear I love that I love the fact that they play the most wild shit like you can hear classical music on the main Berghain dance floor and you can also hear stuff like that um, imagine being in Berlin and something make you run away from the dance floor it must be really really bad but that's the beauty of it right uh, come 5pm at all three rooms all the toilets and numerous crooks and cameras are rammed what i said earlier um my time on sunday which after i left turned into monday and even tuesday showed how beloved greece media is not for any one dj or party but as a space which definitely agree which is this this is part of the reasons i have such an issue with um london spaces somehow because it's great that we have such a good community of um i was just looking online of um what are they called uh minority is it called um ah oh, is it asian minority what it's called there's a, a party promoter group who I met when I went to actually the London, uh, the Resident Advice London community meetup. And she puts on these um, nights that are specifically geared or specifically catered towards showcasing the talents of Asian artists, South Pacific, uh, in, I don't know how you refer to them, but Southeast Asia, right? That kind of segment. And they get some cool people involved. So she's an amazing promoter. That whole thing that they do is great, right? So we have a real good promoter base i think we have probably the best promoters maybe in europe in terms of like putting a show together flyer marketing activation announcement just ingenuity um production but we just don't have the spaces to kind of house them so what you you're going to club nights you're going to origins you're going to half baked you're going to all these club nights all these promoter nights but you're not going to a space that they're operating in just for the night out that's the issue i have with it in london um, we have some spaces that print works and stuff and maybe fold is one of the only exceptions but for the most part you're going for promotions you're not going for clubs and that's the disappointing thing whereas you go to Berlin you're going you don't most of the time when you go to Greece you don't know who's playing until you get there right and you see the lineup you just rock up and you know it's going to have a good you're going to have a good time so again a real shame that it's going um it continues here. Um, it's a, such a it's such a sick club with so many cool details. The walkaway overlooking the main room, the treehouse fire pit, and those random shacks. The silo, arguably one of the best dance floors on the planet. I definitely agree with this um, writer. Uh, sitting by the canal on the summer's day without caring the world. To lose all this is a massive shame. A real blow to Burns nightlife. So if you're going to Cocktail Dome more this weekend, for it will be the final uh, final ever event at this wonderful New Yorker club. Make sure you savor it. This is written by a guy called Carlos Holfen. So definitely check it out. Really cool article. Um, and again, just sad, man. Sad, sad state of affairs, isn't it? For everyone involved. Um, I don't know what they... I hope, again, I think the only saving grace of this is that somehow this is a kind of wake-up call for the scene in Berlin, which I don't sure if they need one, but in terms of just understanding the climate, knowing how to kind of battle these kind of things, because Greece is one of the mainstays. It's not as if like this is like a pop-up. It's not as if this is like... Remember that club Libertines? I'm not sure if it's still open in Berlin for a while. Had like a short little run. Um, it's not a club like that. It's like a, a legit Berlin nightlife establishment, right? And it's being knocked down. It's been told to F off. So maybe there is something, some kind of lack of communication or organization within the nightlife community where they kind of need to band together and make sure it doesn't happen to any other club, right? We don't. We can't have these, we can't have it falling by the wayside the same way London has. And it probably won't because nightlife in Berlin brings in too much money. They won't let it go that far. Um, there's only so many, like, I'm sure most of the, P's comes from the actual Berlin underground clubs as opposed to the ones that are in Mitte and stuff or Mitte or like Kreuzberg. I'd imagine so. Most of them come from the actual ones that are in the ghetto, which makes sense. So I'd imagine they couldn't, they wouldn't kind of go down the London path, but you know, stranger things have happened. So hopefully this is a wake up call for the community. Everyone kind of gets active, activated and tries to take part and make sure we don't have this happen again. And hopefully it's also a chance for the Greece Media team to maybe uh, up sticks and go somewhere new, right? Fresh fresh vision, fresh place. I would be interested to see what they do with a new space, where they house it, temporary spaces, new spaces, I don't know. But again, shame is gone. Uh, but hopefully we have a new uh, spaces coming up 
from the doldrums when they decide where to go next um there's actually i went to actually see what's the if people have been posting anything about Grace miller on instagram because i like doing this on instagram quite often just going on there and doing the location search and you get some clips and videos on people that have been there uh let's just go through it here boom 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 is a on here there's no real stories and let's just go through and check people are writing all their posts on here resident advisor another post there that i'm gonna I'm not gonna read there last call here from um, hector oaks of course big fan of him uh last call last minute call selecting the 50 records that will soundtrack one of the last slots of the history of grace Miller with other legends over excited see you and oh that's really good isn't it imagine that picking 50 records that you think are gonna smash up the grace Miller. amazing that's that's part of the fun of djing though isn't it sitting down with your records and actually selecting the stuff that you want to play so yeah big up hector oats it's a powerful haircut isn't it love your studio man madness so he's obviously bemoaning the fact that it's going to go who else we got here we got uh it's an old photo from dj heidi uh, butch has also got an old post on there eclair fifi supposed to be having a month off but i can't couldn't turn away uh, from this at grease miller it might be the last time i ever get to dj a party here please go and sign a position to stop it closing the party starts tonight oh eclair fifi played there too which is great she's she's smashing it lately as well um who else is playing loads of loads of good posts there from people hugo boss did a shoot there recently was this prosper talking about it another people with stamp the stamps might be something to save them man might have to get that tattooed on you to be fair i would actually recommend it some someone i don't say i don't necessarily agree with the pictures in the toilet i don't think they're a good look because usually the people in the toilets are high off their mind as you can see from these two young ladies but you know c'est la vie the last cocktail was popping up as well um so yeah, definitely check it out, man. This is a bittersweet moment for everyone involved. I'm sure they're going to sign it out in style. I'm sure everyone's going to come out and really kind of give it the going away present that it deserves. And yeah, man, a real shame. A real shame, man. One of the, again, that picture there with the lady sitting on the floor is a real good operate, it's a way to see how amazing and interesting it looks as a venue. It kind of reminds you of what Bar 25 would have been like back in the day because I never got a chance to go to it. Um, I think I, I went to Berlin just after Bar 25 had closed, so I kind of missed that magical moment everyone speaks about so highly, but it kind of reminds me of what Bar 25 would have been. The community, like, it, it the, it's the sum of its parts, right? The, it, like, the people that went there kind of made the space what it is. Um, and again, sitting on the canal, smoking a cigarette. Like, it, this is one of the prime places I end up smoking, where I don't even smoke cigarettes, but you end up going to Greece, you end up going to Berlin and just end up coming back coughing like an absolute drug head because you've been smoking pretending you're a bad boy when you're not really you know what i mean it's a bit it's a bit cringe what can you do but yeah this infamous gang where they walk down just just a real shame man real shame is kind of disappearing a real shame won't be around anymore and again for everyone else involved there's a little video from grace miller definitely play it now And you know what I like too? The fact that there's lack, there's a lack of light and illumination on the DJ booth. It's just him playing, right? That's it. Fucking cool. Just everyone dancing, head down, moshing. Yeah. yeah. Definitely check them out, man, if you're, if you're around this weekend. Um, Goose Muller, Cocktail Domo. One last time. One last time. Anyways, move on. What's next here? Um, Alex Olsen, the most interesting skateboarder in the world. Yep, this is true, and I'm sure most of you are aware of this. A really cool article, interview, feature with the one and only Alex Olsen, a real enigma in the whole skateboarding world. And it's just cool to see how he's evolved over the last few years. Um, he's kind of had a few um real turbulent moments. Which I think that he's kind of talking about in the interview as well. But it's kind of just cool to see the evolution of this guy and where he's kind of come from um always kind of uh evolved to or from whatever that sentence may be um this is a real cool interview with um noah from uh gq kind of you know is the resident is the well, resident skateboarder i'd say right for the most part and kind of uh, alex Olson kind of breaks down his kind of wellness routine and what he kind of does and one thing that really came to mind that really kind of stuck out was his two-hour regimen that he does in the morning before he gets up or before he kind of starts his day meditating stretching all this really amazing cool stuff i'll quickly kind of go through the article now with you so this is um from gq it says radical wellness of pro skater alex olsen this is written by uh, noah johnson or gq style again i'll link in the show notes for you guys uh, listening so you can read it yourself it says here um alex olsen comes out of nowhere uh is it right here 
Elsa comes, comes out of nowhere. I'm waiting on the sidewalk at Greenpoint, Brooklyn, where we agreed to meet for breakfast, expecting him to roll up on a bike or behind the wheel of his Mitsubishi Delizia minivan. Instead, um, he had peers silently on a mini skateboard with a big soft cruiser wheels as a blur of hair and limbs flying off the street. Um, the minivan thing is a big deal, isn't it? A lot of people have been doing that. I've seen a lot of videos online of, of YouTube, sorry, specifically, of younger kids kind of up in sticks, leaving their apartments behind, selling all their gear and just living in a van, which is pretty cool, I think, especially if you're a creator or if you're a content creator or you're trying to um live a more fulfilling life the idea of kind of unshackling yourself from these kind of worldly possessions just kind of living off the land quote unquote or living in a van and wandering around is pretty amazing especially if you make all your living on the internet you don't really need anything but a good internet connection especially nowadays with good dongles or good coffee shops or co-working spaces you could pretty much get all your work done and just hang out and have a good time living in a van so i, I quite like this movement i think it's pretty cool to see younger people doing it too because it would have been a thing where you would have been Back in the day, if you would have seen somebody living in a van, you would have thought they were a pedophile, right? Nowadays, kids are doing it and they're flipping, you know, they might as well be influencers, right? They are influencers for the most part. And it continues. Um, the scion of um, legendary skate punk uh, Steve Olsen. Alex is one of the uh, few second generation professional skateboarders. Yeah, true. Um, he skates for Nike and he's own successful boarding company called 917. But these days, he's just likely to see him surfing on Long Island or DJing in a club on Avenue C or maybe shopping for medicinal herbs at Indian grocery store um austin's various interests or curiosity sorry have led him down a quite a different paths with and without his skateboard he runs a small but highly sought after fashion label called bianca chandon which is easily one of the better um skater owned fashion labels out there or streetwear brands in general which makes limited edition runs of graphic tees hoodies and sportswear but it's it's, it's way more than that they, he actually makes cut and sew like he's uh, bianca chandon is really really fucking good and i like the fact that it's always these small capsule collections like it's like a wardrobe and then he drops it, it sells out, and he drops another one and sells out. It's really, really nice. Like um I still remember that board that he did for his dad, uh, the pro board, the kind of massive cruiser. That was fucking beautiful. Um so yeah, I'm a big fan of his brand. Um and again, I think the the fact that he's a curious individual, like you know, look him in the minivan meditating, makes it more interesting. Like that's what I think is the benefit of life. Like going through life and I can't imagine that's what some people when they say, Oh, you're so when they give me all these weird compliments about the stuff that I do is interesting and cool, I don't really get it because t to me, life is like quite boring just doing the average, the everyday thing, nine to five, going to work, coming back, going on my phone, chilling, sleeping, going up again. That's boring. Why wouldn't I try and, I don't know, if you if you happen to like be watching a documentary about birds and you end up getting interested about a particular breed of bird, why not just like, instead of just stopping it there, why not just Google what that bird breed is read up on some books about it, watch another documentary on migration of that bird in a particular region, maybe find a podcast of somebody who follows birds, or I don't know, get go down that wormhole and discover, discover something. That makes life more interesting than just what? Watching things on surface value, watch, watching things just a surface value brain and just kind of ending it there and kind of moving on. You have to. And I guess it's even more so for a professional skateboarder where you kind of effectively have the world at your hands. You have access to everything at a really young age, probably, you know, um, not the most wise decision, right? You're hanging out with old, it's the, always the really interesting part of professional skateboarders, especially ones that are like, um, especially ones that are like childhood prodigies, right? Or child, child, child prodigies, yeah, Pro prodigies, whatever that word is. You end up going on tour with grown men, right? Around the world, right? Which, which can definitely not be the most constructive way for a, a kid to grow up, um, especially if they don't have like a younger crew kind of team, which nowadays is the in thing to kind of have kids um skating together as a, in a big group but back in the day it was always about kind of getting brought in or kind of getting grandfathered in with a whole older group so i can imagine the things that he's seen he's probably been like you know what i'm all tapped out on that kind of hedonistic lifestyle i'm gonna go in this other way because you've done the other stuff in it there's only so much way you can go down especially with the passing of his friends and stuff and um the un uh untimely death of like dylan Ryder, who's a big who's a close friend of his too so yeah i'm, I'm glad to see his, his evolution man it's really amazing to see it again like just cool i just find it cool that kids will look up to kids will see like the same way that i look at jason deal someone will see alex olsen that way too i think that's really amazing um it continues here um he's an in, he's an in, instable dabbler approaching every new project with an intensity and focus of a first year med student he's been skateboarding since he was 12 and now Austin has come uh ver has become a voracious consumer of all things related to mindfulness and spiritual betterment a self-taught guru in his quest to feel better and make the world a better place definitely if you check out his instagram i used to when i used to be on instagram a lot um, i check his stories always posting some cool books and stuff i think he, he recommended a book that i actually picked up on audiobook called him um, how to change your mind i think it's by some 
meditation guy as well or some kind of new age dude i'm pretty sure i would got it from um uh i got it from alex olsen i think it's the audio but let me see if i can go it here on my phone i can definitely show you what the author's name is. can you pick up yourself load up on here come on iphone let me see let me see let me see library my phone's super slow right now where is it um yeah it's called uh is it no i've it's michael Pollan. It's another one it's another dude i don't think it's how to change around michael Pollan. It's another there's another book anyway another book i remember he recommended there's like a new agey one. It might be that anyway. How to Change Your Mind by Michael Pollan. It might be that. So definitely check that out if you're that way inclined. Anyway, regardless. But let's continue. Um, duh, 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 duh. Uh, since he was 12, a self taught guru. But he would uh, never put it in that way. He's just curious, he says. And in deep world in this rabbit hole of YouTube and Instagram, you'd think that he would be, that would be enough to keep Austin occupied these days and grounded in some kind of culpability or cor- corporability, whatever that word is. But not so much. I'm like a bag blowing in the wind, he says. A chisel Jesus with an aggro edge. Today he's wearing a vintage army jacket, faded jeans, and blue woven uh, leather shoes that resemble Mexican horaches. It's for New York, but he's got a Florida tan. Um, I picked the one easy place in neighborhood, he says, where I thought we'd be able to chat in peace, but I soon realized that I have made a crucial mistake. Olsen is vegan. Anyone who follows him on Instagram, where he obsessively reposts extremely crunchy natural food and medicine memes, knows that. Nothing at this uh, bistro is made without butter, but Olsen perks up when the server tells us the place has oat milk, which is enough to hold us over until the form uh, hold us over in the form of a couple of Americanos. And he says here, whenever I post any of that stuff, Olsen says on Instagram, it's more just for awareness. This may be true. This may be false. It's bringing attention. You can decide. You can decide about benefits of a copping, fasting, and colon cleansing. But Olsen has made his decision. I want to try to squeeze out as much as whatever I can, as many as escape as I can. I just want to feel good, which is great. And it's also something I've kind of noticed, right? I remember when I was doing all my, because I stopped doing it. I had a very conflicted relationship with posting about my reading, my working out, my eating habits, my learning, my self-discovery, my evolution on Instagram, because I felt always felt as if I was like, kind of like showing off how big my dick was. I don't know. But it's a really strange feeling to have because if I go back to my if I go back through my archive of stuff that I was posting when I was in my hedonistic party promoter days, all of it was con- all of it contained going out and getting fucked. All of it. It was all drugs, alcohol, going out late at night. It's just that's all it was. There was nothing in that post that made it seem like I had like a balanced life, right? Um, but I felt pretty good about that, right? I didn't feel away. I didn't feel weird about posting those kind of things. I don't know why <gasps> nowadays I feel bad about posting a book I'm reading because I feel as if like I'm meant, I'm kind of intellectually masturbating myself. I don't know. Maybe it's just me, but it's strange how people can have such a big opinion on like, imagine you post something about cupping and everyone's got something to say, but if you post a picture of a tray of shots, everyone's like, yeah, you go, man. It's like, that's ah, weird. Anyway, um, I like the fact that he wants to squeeze as much as he can out of life because, you know, we're all getting, we're the same age, mamma mia. Also, he's 33 now, but he says a combination of events that occurred around the time he was 30 led him to uh, a few major lifestyle changes. He lost his grandmother and his close friend, Bamba, man, uh, fellow skater Dylan Reader, um, in the same year. Seeing Dylan going through cancer and stuff, you, you, you just like, okay, we need to be healthy, he says. So, awesome. Says also, so he watched the documentaries Cowspiracy and What the Health. He read Meat is for Pussies by Chrome Mag so singer um, John Joseph. I read that and I was like, fuck, I need to do this, which is great, right? I think that's the same thing happened to like, um, um, what's that new documentary on Netflix? Um, Game Changers, right? My brother read that recently and he kind of decided to go vegan for a bit. Even if it doesn't last, the fact that he's got an awareness of this is awesome. I think sometimes picking at the science of it and getting all finicky and saying this can't happen, this can't happen is a bit, you know, not, it's a bit, um, it's a bit pointless the whole point of these kind of videos and documentaries is to kind of open people's minds up to this kind of alternative way of living so if the documentary is able to impact my brother who's just like a regular dude and kind of get him to kind of question his um eating habits or his kind of lifestyle choices or the stuff that he does with his life is great in general right um that's all you can do in this kind of one op- opportunity we're given to live on this planet um, and again, great style here. I love his little minivan. Um, it's, he definitely, you can tell Austin loves, does, does a bit of grounding, and he definitely walks around New York with no with no shoes on, getting get one with the universe. Um, Austin is the kind of person who isn't satisfied by conventional answers. I asked for our example. If he ever takes Advil or other over the counter medicine, and of course, fuck no, he says his cure for headache is to eat oh, 10 almonds, which is a bit new age, it's a little bit Gwyneth Paltrow, but again, if it works for him, no problem. He drinks only distilled tap water to which he adds his own minerals. It's crazy crazy how much better it tastes he says lately he's been um trying to get into the oyoveric diet eating whole foods at set times according to 
doshas, different kinds of energy circulating in the body. So he's definitely gone full woo woo, which I'm, I'm a fan of. I think if you're going to go full woo woo, go the whole hog, do the whole thing. Because again, the hedonistic lifestyle, the party lifestyle, we know what that story is like, right? I've, we've all, what's my Keith Richards autobiography that I've read, right? Elton John's autobiography I just finished now. That um, hedonistic lifestyle, it only ends one way. And if you really want to have a long uh, longevity in your career, you want to grow old, you want to start a family, you want to pass down your wisdom, be a point of reference, or just be alive, you have to, there's a kind of point where you have to rein it in, you just have to. You, there's no other way you can do it, right? Even even Ozzy Osbourne, the one guy that was kind of fighting the fight of the Canas, he's kind of succumbed now to pneumonia, or is it Parkinson's or something, right? Even even he has to kind of put it, knock it on the head a little bit. It has happens to all of us. You have to kind of, you have to decide. You don't have to do one or the other, you just have to make a decision. Uh, ba ba Around the same time he was starting to tweak his diet, he says Olsen hurt his ankle badly on a trip in the Nike skate team. He tried physical therapy and personal trainers, but it didn't help. Like he was making much, it didn't feel like he was making much progress. So he signed up for a one month trial of the Womb Center on Bowery, which is that I think it's an app as well, right? Womb is lot is lot like a typical neighborhood yoga spot, but it's a futuristic flavor of a technology, according to its website. That includes a three D sound baths and projected visual installation. Which sounds amazing. It's very new agey. Olsen says. Um, uh, I was just like, all right, I'm going to immerse myself in this yoga and see what happens. And if I plan myself for a month, which is great. That's why I like to, this is why my plan as well. I like to do one month experiments. Just give it a go. It's one month. One month goes by in a blink of an eye. And then by the end of it, you realize if it's for you or not for you. The fact that people are like, oh, I don't have time. I want to break it down. Because most plans you see, like even workout plans, health plans, it's all like 10 minutes, five minutes. Why they do that? Because they want to get you through the door. They know that if they tell you it's actually going to take you a year to get a body like, I don't know you know, the guys from 300, you're not going to do it. But they tell you to do 30 minute abs and you might get a six pack. It's going to just get you through the door. And the hope is once they get you through the door, doing crunches and eating well and running and stuff, you might hang around. That's the hope. But, you know, usually doesn't happen. Anyway, it continues here, very new agey. I was like, all right, I'm going to my myself in this yoga, see what happens. If I plan myself for a month, after five days or uh, a week for a month, Olsen says his ankle felt strong and perhaps more importantly, his mind felt clear, which makes more sense. I guess if you're in a, a carb-heavy diet, there is, a, like, there is a tendency of, of inflammation, which I'm sure if you're skateboarding and you twist your ankle, probably isn't the best option, probably isn't the best way to go around bad things. So the fact that he's changed his diet in some way, shape or forms and took a different path in terms of physical therapy might have definitely helped his ankle. I, I'm, not, I'm not against that whatsoever. I think that's definitely possible. I was going to continue here. Then one day a friend told him about Wim Hof, which is, you know, the guy, really. I think if you listen to this podcast, you know who Wim Hof is. I think everyone knows who Wim Hof is at this point, says Olsen. From those like me who didn't, Wim Hof, a.k.a. the Iceman, is a Dutch guy who hangs out while mostly nude in icebergs, plays guitar, runs marathon barefoot in the snow, and swims in frigid waters. Hof believes that you can train yourself to control your body through breathing in order to suppress pain, strengthen your immune system, and elevate your mood. Definitely agree with that one. Wim Hof, Wim Hof Method, which I did, I did a couple years ago, actually. Or was it three years ago? I did the whole class the whole school sorry the whole class i downloaded it i think um yeah i'm pretty sure i did yeah did i did a couple of years ago yeah i'm pretty sure i did the whole meditation lying down sitting up breathe exercises yes yeah, super super good i really recommend you check it out the Wim, Wim Hof method combines breathing exercises with exposure to cold often in the form of icy showers it's all about controlling your heart rate with your breath and having them in sync Olson says it's so cold that you have nothing to focus on but one thing there's no other thought which I think is really the hardest thing in meditation. Completed two, he also completed two Wim Hof courses online, but skipped the final one. He said, like, go and walk in the snow in the mountains. I'm like, who the fuck has that? I mean, yeah, we have snow, but I don't have a fucking cold spring that I can jump into. Um, yeah, it looks really cool, man. I love this whole article. And so yeah, I recommend you check it out. I won't read the whole thing, but definitely check it out. Um, Alex Olsen on GQ, he looks, he looks tight, man. He looks fucking fit as a fiddle, to be fair. No homo or yes homo. Um, I'm loving the beard. I'm loving the skateboard Jesus look here. So definitely check him out. Alex Olsen, one of my... Um, well, someone I look up to, I think, to be honest. Yeah, he's interested, definitely. Man, the way he's kind of segued into different sort of career paths, the fact that he kind of had a record label going for a while, putting out little EPs, uh, making edits on tracks that he's only... Yeah, I don't think he only DJed for like a few years and he was really making fucking tracks, doing much more than I was doing, DJing, playing vinyl and stuff, uh, hanging out with DJ Harvey and um uh dr dunks what's his name dunks i've got his name the first is it dr dunks i think so just being around all those cool people and just doing his damn thing nine nine one seven uh nine one seven the skateboard brand which is a bit more for the kids and then obviously bianca chandon which is for the mandem so yeah definitely check out uh, uh alex august interview on gq again i'll put in the show if you guys check out yourself but a really good read and a really eye-opening look into 
you know, what curiosity can do, man, how it can help you kind of, you know, um, explore other areas of your life. Okay, okay, okay. How much, uh, how much time we've done so far? Should we move on? Let's do one more here. <laughs> oh, 10 best sneakers from the Paris Fashion Week. This is quite cool. From Hypebeast, right? Um, Again, Paris Fashion Week article, uh, blog or vlog or video or podcast I've got to do probably later on today. There's a lot of things I've got to catch up on that I haven't really spoken about. But so far, there's a really cool roundup from Hypebeast that kind of round up some of the better shoes to come out during the season. I want to quickly go through them so we can kind of have an idea on what's coming out and what's going on. Um, what do we have here? Da, da, da. Let's quickly just go through make sure there's the right. Oh, actually, these are, these are not the right one. I want the ones from Vogue. Let's see if I can get it here. Uh, but, oh no, let, let's, let's do this from Hypebeast. Let's, let's, let's go through this because some of the ones I like, some I don't like. So this is from Hypebeast, right? Beep, 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 beep. The 10 most notable shoes from Paris Fashion Week for 2020. Again, Paris Fashion Week, you know, it's the premier place for menswear. I think everyone's kind of noticed that. You always see the levels jump up from like London, Milan to Paris. It's just not fair. The amount of talent is there. Uh, the amount of expertise. The fact that everyone shows out for it. The fact that all the streetwear brands have now kind of adopted Paris as like their kind of home away from home. Paris is like turned into kind of the new Berlin. Because I remember when bread and butter was the thing in Berlin. Or I forgot the other one in Amsterdam. There's another, there another kind of trade show thing that used to go on in Amsterdam. Everyone used to go there. But now it feels like everyone is going to Paris to go and hang out. Showrooms, activations, launches. That's the place to go. Because well, again, all the menswear stuff is there. So if you're a menswear brand, it will be smart for you. If you're, a, if you're a streetwear brand and you want to attract other men to go and buy your product, it'll be smart for you to go head, of, head over to Paris Fashion Week when that was on, right? So this is Hypebeast article kind of rounding up some of the 10 most notable ones that are on social that are kind of bubbling up and stuff. So um, first on the list here is Valentino and Onitsuka Tiger Mexico 66 SD sneaker. Um, I'm going to pass on these, even having a comment. I hate the Onitsuka Tiger. I think they had a short run during the whole Kill Bill thing. Right, when everyone was kind of trying to make these work. But as an actual sneaker to wear, no thank you. If I'm going to wear this kind of like indoor soccer shoe, I'm just going to go for Adidas Gazelle. It's a classic. It's got a lot of history behind it. It's a staple. It should be a staple in everyone's wardrobe. And it looks far better than the Nitsu Tiger. So, um, yeah, I'll pass on them for the most part. Of course, you're going to see the same person that wears already. He's probably wearing this kind of shoe, fluorescent, bold colors, the massive logo on the side. If you care about that kind of branding, it's definitely in the shoe for you. But for me, I'll pass. Um, actually, the the OG vintage shoe looks quite cool. So it's a vintage OG colorway, white upper, blue accents with the sort of like suede new bucky uh, front little toe cap thing, which looked pretty interesting with the stamp of the Valentino on the side. That looks quite great. I would have preferred to have the Valentino stamp on the instep instead of the outside of the shoe, just for my own sake. Because again, I don't like the over branding. But as a shoe, not too bad, but not for me. Uh, next on here we have the uh, Raf Simmons runner. Which is essentially just his rip on um, on a Stan Smith. Uh, again, I would imagine the good thing about Ralph Simmons because he's such an attention to detail hog and he's such a obsessive of a design. He's probably made some little tweaks um, on the Stan Smith that he probably wasn't a fan of, right? So when brands collaborate with when luxury brands, when just any brand collaborates with a sportswear or a trainer or a sneaker or athletics brand that can make something for them because they can't have the resources to make them themselves because you know shoes are really expensive to make. You usually do it on a model that you kind of are exploring to kind of introduce it to market or you have your dream shoe. Then once you get the resources or the investment to make your dream shoe, you end up tweaking the things that you don't like about that shoe to make it work for your own vision. That's what I love about it. So, you know, I think about the Selene Air Force One. I think about the Blanchard Triple S, even a recent one. I think about the Alexander McQueen shoe, that stacked one. Like they look at a, a model that's on the market and they're like, you know what? I would love if I could, if it could be like that, if it could be like this, if it could be like that, and do these little tweaks. So sometimes I think, even though it looks really plain, it looks really simple, there's a, probably a lot of detail in this um, Raph Simmons runner that we're not seeing that's probably going to make it a little bit better than the stances that you get from Adidas, which again, it's a great shoe, especially the 80s retro that they put out with the sort of like off-white midsole and off-white kind of sail upper. It's really a beautiful shoe, but it's a very particular shoe to wear depending on your feet. And for my feet, <clears throat> So I'm a big fan of this so far. Um, it looks like it's a completely leather. Is that oh suede insole? If it was a complete leather insole, that would have been pretty sweet. But yeah, um, a kind of essentially just like a Stan Smith um, in luxury uh, leather, really buttery soft with the peer eyes. Then you have this amazing sort of like Hurachi type shoe with a kind of flap on the front of it, which looks very interesting. I like the look of that. And just from the look of it as a range, it looks already two shoes 
these two shoes look a lot more interesting than the entire thing Raph has done with Adidas. It's because again, those or 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 whatever they're called, I was never a fan of them. I thought they looked a bit meh, especially considering the stuff that Raph does for his mainline collection. The Adidas collaboration looked a bit like an afterthought, as if like you know, it's something that he picked up. It looked like you know the you know what they look like the Origis. They look like a shoe Adidas were contemplating to make didn't make it it was on the kind of cutting room floor and Raph Simmons saw that and just kind of co-opted it that's what it looked like to me it didn't look like he actually designed the shoe because these look a lot more in line with Raph Simmons aesthetic than those shoes ever did so those these two are pretty cool then it has this amazing little like ballerina pump uh booty with like a really high heel on it which looks great I want to see what that looks like on um it's essentially just like a non sock it's like a socky uh upper that's leather with like a, a trainery kind of heel on the back of it amazing detail very well put together again reminds you of something a stu that the studio Heigl, whatever that studio is in, in in holland that does all those really interesting um diy sneaker projects or looks it looks like something that they would do so i'll interested to see what it looks like once they put a sock on it or other materials but so far in the leather that looks very beautiful and then last but not least you got the kind of chelsea boot which is probably my favorite of the whole collection it looks like a you know, quintessential riding boot in this really luxe leather with Raph Simmons stamped on the, on the on the side and yeah just a kind of seamless smooth upper at the top with this amazing ring pull tab at the back which is a little bit BDSM-y but again really up my street so those are really interesting moving on we got the Cold War uh, for Winter in-house shoe collection he's been he's been kind of debuting he's been kind of um slipping this out little by little on the runway um which I would like did a couple of collections with collaborations with Nike and then for the most part, Simon has been kind of really steering himself towards the, uh, trying to make his own shoes. And I love it because, you know, he did, makes his own soundtrack, has his own furniture, um, set designers all in-house. It only makes sense for the aesthetic of a cold war to kind of bring your shoes in-house too. And for me, they look beautiful. Again, it's a kind of a flip of an Air Force One that he's kind of looked at an Air Force One, decided the bits and the elements that you like about it and don't like about it, and then try and bring it in to your kind of brand ethos. And it looks fucking beautiful. Luxury leather um all black upper uh minimal paneling uh, i love the little detail at the back i think it's suede or nubuck little detail here in the back uh solid midsole one color um but my favorite of course is definitely this chelsea boot this chelsea boot looks insane Look, the whole rippled sole behind like just really really beautiful sole uh massive chunky heel um and again just something i'd, I'd wear the fuck out of this shoe every single day um then you've got sort of like a little kind of walking shoe would you call it a walking shoe like a kind of everyday sort of like hiking shoe which was pretty cool and you've got the chelsea boot uh sole put on the essentially like a derby i'd imagine it's probably got laces that are probably covered on the inside there and then last but not least you've got this sort of like runner which is probably my least favorite of the shoe in collection that's in there but so far three out four shoes for your first um kind of like footwear outing is probably good with me of course you've got the edge Jordan five virgils which i'm off white sorry that i've kind of spoken about already um, then you've got Dior for winter footwear, which again, I'm not, I, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of this Dior Converse, especially the the other one that was a kind of net, but I don't really find this kind of pile, uh, fur one. I think it looks a bit shit personally, but I like, um, the approach again. So these ones are the best, these sort of like translucent or kind of Converse looking ones. They look really good. I saw a girl wearing them actually the other day and they looked incredible, especially on smaller feet. Um, the boots, not really a big fan of, so I'll skip on those. Of course, the Elite's, um, Air Force One, you know, my opinion on those, one of my favorites, easily you know my opinion on black shoes <laughs> especially black air force ones especially black air force ones high especially black and white air force ones like just everything's a win entire collection is an absolute win an absolute go i can't wait to see what it's looking like in real life and then you've got lastly you've got the kiko costa costandinov at six he's been doing asset collaborations from the minute in it from day dot really um so that's cool to see i'm surprised he hasn't done collaboration with hook with with hoka one one right um i'm pretty sure i saw was it the first couple of shows? You, most of these models were wearing hooker shoes. I'm pretty sure. I'm surprised why they hadn't done one with them. Maybe they don't collaborate much. Because you don't really see them doing many any collaborations, do they? Only with like engineered garments and stuff. You don't really see many much from them. But yeah, they look pretty cool. Again, um, I, the stuff that he does the best, I think, with the collaboration with Asics is usually the boots or some of the stuff he's done with Camper. I really like them. I think the runners are so-so. But I think the boots, he's always got a really interesting way of kind of you know um, introducing weird models at, with a brand you don't really associate making those kind of boots like they've got this remember that kind of big duck sort of like wintry uh wellington boot thing he did with camper like he did really some really cool stuff so i think he's got a really good talent with that again the runners i'm not really a big fan of because i would get that kind of shoe from somebody else but i think the boots are really really stellar so i can't see what they look like look in look, look how amazing that looks that, that's an asic shoe you know 
it's in this kind of like faux lizard or crocodile skin um, upper. It's fucking banging. So big up him with that one. Um, and another interesting shoe there too. Pinned as well at the bottom there for detail. Um, and then of course, you've got the Futura Vibram Gore-Tex sneaker, which I previewed before as well. And last but not least, you've got the Sakai Full Winter 20 shoes, which in my opinion, I've said to my friend recently, I think this is the best one. I know the first LDV, LD Wolf where everyone's kind of uh, still kind of wanking over, but I think these are the best ones. These look so banging. Like, I love how exaggerated and how ridiculous they look. I love the fact that they've kind of taken the whole, like, um, stacking the models on top of each other to the nth degree. You've kind of got, look how far that lace day comes up to the front of the shoe. It's incredible, the paneling, the application of it, the colorway. And again, you know what's really clever about this too? The genius level is the colorway application. Because I think the model itself with the whole like stacking of the shoes is cool. But you could really fuck it up easily if you don't get this right. The color placements. It can really look crazy. But I don't know. There's something about how they do it. It just works really, really well, man. Wow. These are going to be so popular when they come out. So definitely if you want a pair, definitely get your name down the list. Next, we've got the White Man Sneering into Corny Ugg. Interesting collaboration there. Ugg is trying to make a movement into... Oh, yeah. They've got these stacked shoes I previewed on my Twitter, isn't it? Yeah. So these look a bit like hookers. On their own. So I think everyone's trying to make a the next kind of big hit in terms of footwear for the next season. So you're going to see a lot of these coming out. Again, interesting shoe. I love the look of it. Interesting to see how Ugg is kind of deviating away from their traditional sort of like booty boot. That looks really cool. I'd actually wear that to be fair. That is it Ugg and Dana? Wow. Oh, no, uh, so they got a collaboration with Sukorni, Ugg and Dana. Okay, I about to say. So that's a Dana boot. That's not an Ugg. I about to say. That, that looks really nice. That's too good for an Ugg and hit. No offense to them lot. And there's a Sukorni. Okay, see, that's interesting. Fashion brands are allowed to collaborate. This is one season and they've got collaboration with free. But I guess because they're not free, probably they don't operate in the same markets, right? They're collaborating with three different brands in one collection. Interesting, isn't it? Sukorni, Ugg, and Dana. Okay, fair enough. But I like, I like it. I like what I see there from what I'm answering. And I think that's it, isn't it? Yeah, so that's it. Um, whole list is there on, on, on Hypebeast. Again, I'll put in the show notes for you guys to check out yourself. 10 most notable shoes from Paris Fashion Week 4 into 20. Yeah, cool. Anyway, that's it, man. It's been an hour already. Thank you so much for tuning in for the Excellent Zinger Show, episode number 278, I think it was. As per usual, if you're listening via the podcast app, um, please leave me a five-star review and share the show with your friends. If you're watching via the YouTube app, smash that like button, hit subscribe, leave me a comment, let me know what you think of the show. And I'll see you guys again, I think, tomorrow for the episode of the show. Yeah, tomorrow. Um, if you're around this Trafford area, you want to hear me play, definitely come by the Leighton Star tomorrow night and i'll be there um if not i'll see you guys again later on take care be safe look left and right when you're crossing the road be well my friends bye